Hello there. Welcome to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so excited about tonight. A, it's been a great day because I got to go and have lunch with my dear friends, Denise and Ron Pridemore. And we got into the place that they love, that they say they can't ever get into. So if you're in Pensacola Beach, Flanders Chowder House is where you want to go. Now, this has been quite a week. We have we have had so much going on. I am in Gulf Shores, as you can probably tell, because it's not my office. And I have been enjoying closed water because there's hurricanes, a hurricane in the Gulf, and we have six foot waves, five to six foot waves, which we don't get without a storm. So all you can do is walk on the beach and get a microdermabrasion while you do it. The wind's so good. So we are, you know, Fate Magazine is just really going gangbusters. I have some trading cards. I have some magazines. If you run into me somewhere, ask me. I've got them, and I will be glad to share with you. And I, we've got so much going on with the network. We are um, going to be Dark Realm TV, and we're going to be on your Roku. So that's getting ready to happen. Big deal. And I'm so excited about the people that we're going to be affiliated with. I love all of them. So big things happening here, including my guest tonight. My guest is Cheryl Costa. And y'all know her because she's been here before. She is just a brilliant data analyst. Um, with her wife, Linda, they are, they have put out UFOs, you know, in Alabama, UFO of Texas. You, I mean, if it's your state, they have the book and you need to go get it. It's on Amazon. She is also just, she's written columns on UFOs. She's a playwright. She has been a newspaper journalist talking about that. She had a story back in the day um, about, about Johnny Appleseed being an abduction story that was published in Fate. She knew she submitted it, but she didn't know it got published. So as soon as um, as soon as I said something about it to Phyllis, Cheryl had two copies because Phyllis knows where everything is, and she remembered that story. It must have just stuck with her, which doesn't surprise me because I am enjoying this new book that Cheryl has out. It's the second oldest profession. And the details are just amazing. And I was sitting there going, I'm not seeing anything UFOlogy in here. That's quite a you know switch for her. And we're going to let you tell her why I haven't gotten to it yet and what all happens with that. But mainly, let's welcome Cheryl Costa. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Oh, busy as always. <laughs> you are always busy. So I am, we're going to talk about a little bit of everything, but before we get started, thank you for being here. You're such a dear friend. I am so enthused with your book. It's such a, it's really big. I mean, playwright, best creative, not necessarily fiction, but kind of it is. Um, everything since I've known you has been data oriented. And so now we're back to creativity and man, what a lot of creativity in this book. I love it. And you know, to, to let people know you served in both the air force and the Navy during the cold war. Yes. And I served, I was the air force, I served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a telephone lineman. People shoot at you on telephone poles, you know, I and see that. And then I, a couple few years later, I wanted some high tech training. So I joined the Navy and uh, went in for a sizable period of time. And I did a lot of very interesting stuff there. Yes. And, you know, when last time we were together, I think was contacted the desert, right? And uh, that, yeah. Was, yeah. that was yeah. the day of the hearings. And. Yep. You were the one, because I saw it flash across my Apple News, but I was packing, trying to get out the door. 
And so when I hit the lobby, you were the first person I saw it. And you were like, so what do you think? And I'm like, well, about what? <laughs> we we were all losing our we were all losing our losing cookies our about it. I, I mean, it I, um, was. I was down there. I was down there with um, um, who's the guy who is in New Mexico with with the alien crash for Roswell? His kid. Um, oh, uh, um, Paul. Paul. Yes. And I'm dropping a name. I apologize. He. It's okay. We're on opposite sides of the table having coffee. Yeah. And and somebody came over and showed us the headline on their phone. We both spill our coffee on ourselves. Trust me. We were going, whoa. <laughs> it baby. was so exciting. Yes. And I found it ironic that it was the closing day of like the biggest UFO conference in the country. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> but this is happening. And all of the all of the main talking heads are doing their their um classes, their lectures, their presentations. Because people had signed up for those, you know, outside of the conference. And right. so they were they were in a classroom environment. Yeah, you know, Mark D'Antonio was in there doing one. Um, Childress was in there. I, I'm pretty sure Whitley was doing one at the time, too. Everybody was doing their final. Yeah. It was it was the, the final talks route. that morning. And a lot of us yeah. were already packed and we're getting ready to be driven out. Yeah. You know? So it was crazy. It was crazy. That and was I'm a really that was a real special conference for me. That was. And uh, uh, I, you're not completely done with the book. No, I'm not. So, but, but I, you will get to the end, and yeah. you will see that it was a, it was an emotional day. Uh, the day before we left was an emotional day for me, because I mentioned it. I mentioned Contact in the Desert 2023, mm -hmm. and you'll see in the last page of the book what, what, what happened. Oh, you shouldn't have told me that. Because <laughs> I've got I'm it right here. You all the way back to Bama. <laughs> I've got it right here, and I'm not going to go read that last page. I'm not. Okay. So, what a tease you are. <laughs> I've been told that a lot. <laughs> But, you know, it's really, um, I have always, you're the first person like you I've ever had as a, a dear friend. Thank you're, you. you're very diverse. You're very, um, well, am I going to offend you? No. Because you're the first person I know as an adult who has actively transitioned, who has been a, a beautiful man, a beautiful woman. The soul is always there. It's always the same. You're, you're beautiful inside and out. And, you know, when we started becoming friends, it was just so nice for me because every time I see you, you know, I'm just thrilled. And then Linda has started coming to the events with you. And that is just an even better thrill. And, you know, you were in the military when that wasn't really a thing. And you were kind of a. During the a, Vietnam um, era, yeah, you got spit on in airports. Trust me, I did. Yeah. But I mean, but you still were true to yourself. And that strength of character is something that not everybody can pull off well. I think no, that... Nathan, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just... I think that the bravery that went along with the conviction to be who you are is something that has always been a special part of you to me. Plus, the research that you do, um, the Wiccan things that you do, you're very involved and very good at what you do at everything you've tried that I've seen. And I just appreciate you. Thank you. So, you know, that's really something I probably should have said to you when we were face to face, I could give you a hug, but we'll get around to that at a conference this year. But we, um, we sort year. of danced around it in Arkansas too, you know, at, the, at that yeah. conference, you know, so, you know, yeah. 
sometimes so, it, you, you try to have a tender conversational moment with someone and three people will always come by and spill a Coke on you or something. Yes. You know, it, 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 there's this functionality but, called fate that just messes it up. You know, I'm, a, I'm familiar with fate. It's right up there. So, <laughs> that's fun. But, you know, I really do think that a lot of, a lot of why I admire and am so open to the work that you do is because I know your character. And I know that if you're going to tell me something, I can take it to the bank. When you're doing the compilations of the UFO sightings, when you're doing, you know, well, everything. You're just really very good at what you do. Thank so you. thanks for Thank that, you. because it makes me enjoy the research. Thank you. Yeah. And I do have my UFO cases in Alabama. <laughs> Very good. You know, so, I had to tell somebody the other night, they wanted to know, how do we find the book? You go into Amazon book search. You put in my name, Cheryl Costa yes. with C's. Okay, Cheryl and Costa with a C. C. And, you and you type in the name, just the name of your state mm -hmm. in Amazon book search. And boom, your book uh, UFOs in Alabama, boom, is mm -hmm. right there. Or whatever the name of your state is, it will be yeah. right there. We've done 53 books about UFOs. Uh, uh, two of them were uh, high-level analysis books. Mm -hmm. And then I got this crazy, wacky idea that Linda would stand up at conferences and say she'll never do it. You know, And I, I generated, in 18 months, I generated 50 individual state books with detailed down to the zip code and village yes. level. Okay. Yes. Now I had some people when they came out complain, but it doesn't have our little village in it. And we had UFO sightings since it, then nobody reported it. That's right. You know, I can't count it if it's not reported, you know. But the bottom line is there's 53 UFO books out there, and one of them just happens to be uh I, I should show it off real quick. Why don't you? Yeah. Okay. I was always a subcontractor. This is a great book. Yeah, sub. I was a subcontractor at the newspaper. I was not actually on paid staff. I just yes. got paid per per column that I did, and I mm -hmm. wrote a weekly column for seven years. Now, what does that mean? That means an eight hundred word term paper every Thursday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, but this is a book. When the newspaper went under in June of 2019, I had been there since June of uh, 2013, seven mm -hmm. years. And because I was a contractor, I technically owned my columns. So I got permission from the publisher to go into their server and get the final edited versions of all of my columns. Right. And we put them in a book. Okay. And it's a great book. It's I have that book. one too. <laughs> Lots of stories. If you like stories, great. Now, the, the, yes. the books about UFOs in your state, there are no stories. It's where it's the settings the happen, where it is, and that type of thing. But that's what people were asking if we came out with the big analysis books. We went down to the county level, every mm -hmm. state down to the county level. And people were saying, well, I want to know what's going on in my town or village or hamlet. And uh, so we worked on it through the COVID lockdown. Yeah. What else? Were we? we were all dressed up, no place to go. There were, there were I, I didn't get out of my pajamas for goodness <laughs> sakes, you know? Um, so and I had all these people call me. I used to live in a Buddhist monastery for seven mm -hmm. years. Okay. People yeah. were calling me up. I can't handle being alone. I said, welcome to monastic life. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I had training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you how to deal with it. You know, um, but the deal was um, we worked on it all through uh, the 2020 and 2021 lockdown. Okay. And yeah. I just, got up every day he had my breakfast and sat there and worked on this thing quietly in one end of the house and linda did whatever she was doing at the other end of the house and uh that was it and what i did was i built each individual book of all 50 books mm -hmm. and when we moved at the end of 21 to the north coast of ohio mm -hmm. essentially the cleveland regional area um i came to linda and i said i have all 50 books done she thought it would take years. Yeah. Okay. But it's an amazing thing. People think you sit down and start typing out a book. No, I had already built a lot of pieces of it doing the big books. 
-hmm. So I just cranked out the statistics for individual states and did the individual charts and graphs, that type of thing, and the maps and that type of thing. So these days you take things like PDFs and you just assemble a book like this, you know, with the electronic PDFs, put them in the right order and get the number of the pages. That was easy. So when we launched the 50 books, I'm a magical person. Okay. We launched the first one. It was UFOs in Ohio. And we launched it on Halloween, what Wiccans call Samhain, mm-hmm. okay, of 2022. And then next week we did Michigan, okay. And then we did a couple of singles again after we'd done five books. And we really had the process down of doing the, the, the registration on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. And Linda does all that. She mm-hmm. had it all solid. Then I said, here, I'm going to give you five. And she did five registrations, and that day, five went up. We did it this way right through for a couple of weeks, five a week, five a week. And then we got down to the um, uh, last part of November, and I said, are you game for 10? And I gave her two last runs of 10. One week, and then the next week, we gave her the last 10. And we managed to produce the entire 50 books for actual publication mm-hmm. in the six week period between Halloween, Samhain, and Yule, which is the place we wanted to get it done in one magical period. And that's what we did. Well, good choice. <laughs> you know, publishing 50 books in six weeks isn't magic, baby. You're not paying <laughs> <laughs> Even if it is formulaic, it still work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is still so much work. And the books are, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, five different census regions in the United States. Okay. Yeah. So we colored the book by, we established a color for each census region. So that's why when you go on Amazon, if you search all of those, you'll see that there's like four or five different colors. And it's because of that. Yeah. Well, I was surprised, but you know, I didn't know. I was presenting at a paranormal conference and it was in a small town in Alabama we scheduled the organizer scheduled it on the day of a UFO festival in Alabama. It's like a town <laughs> over from where it was. I didn't even know we had a UFO festival. I'd never heard of Fife, right? Fife had a huge experience. The town did. So now I know, and now I'm aware to go and do, but you know, it's really fun. Because I'm always on the, I'm always on my deck. I have dogs, right? And I'm a I'm a yard sitter anyway. I like to go mm-hmm. out and hang out with the dogs and do stuff. And I was outside the other day, and I looked up at Jupiter, and there's a light beside it. And I'm like, and it was red. So I got my binoculars, right? And I went outside, and I'm looking at it, and I noted the time. And as soon as it was a decent hour, I messaged Mark D'Antonio and I was like, it is 452 in the morning. There is something beside Jupiter. It looks like a star, but it's not. And when I got my binoculars, it's red. So I sent him the message, but I left out the word Jupiter because (laughs) yeah, five o'clock in the morning. So, um, he sent me a message back. He said, well, I think you left something out that's pretty important. Can you go back and read that <laughs> and send it to me? <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jupiter. I left out Jupiter, but there you go. So if you could just, what is that? And it was something planetary. I mean, it was supposed to be there. And I think I shock him. I shock a lot of people because if I see something, I, well, you know, I'm shocking anyway, right? But you report it. I report them. (laughs) And I had an experience and, you know, the SCU guys, the Scientific Coalition on UAP Studies, I had talked to them about this because quite often when there are meteor showers, I see something go and stop in Orion in the belt. And it has happened a lot of times, like enough that 
you know, it's always there. I've seen goofy things in, in Orion as well. Yeah. And so, you know, I was talking to them and they were like, well, you should film that. I said, well, I don't have the equipment to film that, you know, but if you can tell me what to use, I'd like to do that. And so the guy was, yeah, he was actually being kind of, you know, hmm. And I was just kind of like, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to find a way to do that. And then the MUFON person um, asked me why I didn't report it. And I said, I have reported it. But every time I do, the system kicks me out. I've tried it three different occasions. And every time my report did not go through their program. So I'm just kind of like, well, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, hear, I hear that. I hear that a lot from people. Yeah. And, you know, they're big. That should work because that's where everybody tries to go and report things to. And, you know, Jar with Butch Wachowski was the person that I would actually talk to the most about that. And I miss him so much. But where would you go? What would you do? What do you me, do? Me personally? Yeah. Um, as much as I like the folks over at MUFON, um, I, these days, I, if, if I have to report something, I report it to uh, National UFO Reporting Center. Yeah. Okay. I know they're not going to have a boots on the ground team or something like that, but the thing is, I know it will get in. I, I know for a fact it will get in the database. They got a really, that's what really, I want. They got a really, really sharp. Uh, a database manager over there. They've reorganized the way they dis they display, you know, the availability, of the sightings, and everything like this. I think they took some hints from us because of the way we were organizing their data, you know, mm -hmm. in our books. And um, uh, they've really, really made it very easy to look things up on that site. And uh, my hats off to them. It really is. So. Well, thank you for that. And I'm not slamming Mupon. I'm a member, but. I just, I, you know, the funny is I can't be because I'm, I'm still, I'm still a functioning journalist uh, and our lawyers, uh, the lawyers we work under, uh, we have a very draconian uh, conflict of interest clause. So and every time I've tried to, they say, well, you should join. I said, I, I can't. Yes. Okay. So, but well, I mean, I just wasn't slamming them because, you know, I know so many people that do a lot of really great things there and I would never slam they them. Do. I think they're a great they organization. They do. I, but I that think, reporting system is annoying. I think their IT system needs some uh, serious upgrade. It has for a long time. You know, maybe it they moved it the last couple of years, but the last couple of times I was on it, say two years ago, it was still really clunky. Yeah. So, But again, it's a function of funding, things like this. Maybe they don't it have the deep pockets that they had. You know, so. Yeah. Well, Every organization everybody's jumped people. into their into their backyard. So, well, you there's know, a also lot of people doing what they do. Since some of the deep throated guys did testifying, okay, uh, suddenly accessing them has been difficult. Accessing MUFON's been difficult. I've been completely shut out. So, really, um, yeah, uh, they they won't generate a report from me for anything. So I get, I, I, I don't do anything anymore. I don't do right. any statistical work. I, I did a 20 year study. Linda and I did a 20 year study and that was yeah. our objective. The first 20 years of the 21st century. And that's, yeah. we walked away from it. I write other right. stuff now. As is evidenced by my being able to, <laughs> you know, I had to drive. I'm in the middle of a GC park. I'm like, I have to leave. I have to get going. And it was hard to do that because I was not in the mood to, you know, not finish the book all in one sitting. So, well, you, you, you gave me a great compliment. It was a couple of days after you got the book. Yeah. And you said that you fell asleep with it on your face. <laughs> I did. So, one, you know, one of the reviews I got said I was up to this one lady out in California. Says, I was up till 337 in the morning. I couldn't keep my eyes open. This thing is a page turner. You know, so. I wore it. <laughs> I did. I wore it. 
<laughs> so let's talk about the book. Let's talk about this the book. Day, I want to, what would you like, like to know? I want well. There's a lot of questions I have. A. Ask what you want. I'll answer what I can. Okay. That's How that. close is this to being a biography or autobiography? Officially, it's fiction. Officially, it's a figment. It's a figment of my imagination. I was of never course. there. Right. I do not speak Russian. Well, not at all, comrade. No, no let's you, see. You, you have net net tavrarishis. No, comrade. Of course. And I have never heard you greet me in Russian. I have never greeted you in Russian? You oh. have greeted me in Russian. Okay, well, <laughs> it, actually, what it would probably be, uh, it, since I know you more, it would be more yeah. like um, um, a prefet sister, uh, 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 greeting yeah. sister, you know, that type of thing. Well, what was funny was that um, when you did it, when I worked as a work study, I, my job was in a library. And there was a how to speak Russian book. And I was like, this isn't even my alphabet. <laughs> you know? no. So it was, I was 19. I was a freshman in college, well, sophomore in college. And it was just like, maybe this isn't my color feeling. I'm great with languages, but I learn by mimicking. I don't learn by rote and which is why my Latin teacher hated me so much because yeah, I could pass the test and never have looked at anything and just, you know, it's like anything else though. Um, once they immerse you into it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, let's say it this way uh, in, in the book, uh, our, our initial hero, Charles Stewart. Okay. Um, he gets out of the Navy on a, on a contract glitch. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, that parallels my life directly. It's exactly how I got on the Navy after going to $300,000 worth of school. Okay. Um, and uh, they went, sent him to language school. So he had rudimentary, mostly listening and uh, not so much speaking as much as being understanding what's being mm -hmm. said. If you're listening to it on a radio set or something. Okay. Right. And then um, Charlie Stewart gets, uh, uh, training with a tutor they, he gets uh, he gets hired literally 10 minutes out of the navy there are two guys in dark suits waiting for him and um uh i decided to make the character uh, um, a little bit challenging very much like myself and they said so you really want to be a woman <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he thinks he's going to go to jail you know and um, different era yeah the, yeah well this is 1979 1980 and the, the attitude was, you guys are spooks. You could never, you are these high secret agencies. You're all Princeton, Harvard, Yale guys. You'd never hire somebody like me who's going to go through a gender change in five or 10 years, right? Yeah. And the one guy at the recruiting team said, nope, nope, never, never in a million years. And the second guy said, but that would be the most incredible cover story. Yes. <laughs> because nobody would ever believe that you work for us, you know. And um, that's how they signed you up. That's how they signed me up. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had to be, okay, officially, I had to be extremely careful. You know where that story came from to begin with? The Tell whole me. book, the book it came from? I write short, short stories. I write murder mysteries. Uh, I got contracted last summer to write uh, write a ghost story set in the Adirondacks of the, upstate New York. Uh, 14 of us were contracted to do this, and that book's coming out in the spring. Okay. I can't wait. Um, uh, mine's called Thumper. Thumper. Yeah, that's that's what the ghost does. Thumps on the walls, right? I will be oh. looking for that. Listening okay. for that. That too. It, it's colorful. Trust me. So um, the, I think that the important thing to keep in mind was that I just lost my train of thought. Don't get old. Trust. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> okay. The um, the idea behind the book was to. I the, I went to the VA in 2022, okay, Veterans Administration, and there were some issues my civilian doctor couldn't deal with, and I, I was shaking like a leaf that they they took me in there because the last time I had touched the VA, maybe 15, 18 years before, they treated me very badly as a trans woman. They tr just treated me horrible, 
Okay. And I had been told they had come a long way. So I went there, gave them my, my two fourteens, which are discharge papers. And, um, uh, they saw I was a Vietnam vet. So when they saw a Vietnam vet, was, oh my God, there's a whole bunch of predisposed issues you already, we already know about, you know, like I was exposed to agent orange, you know, whole bunches of stuff. They ran me through a battery test and said, you know, you got about a 70 year old case of PTSD. <laughs> I'm going, oh yeah, you think, you you think? Know? kid pops a, a, a balloon at Denny's in the birthday room there and I'm under the table, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, most people say, well, wait a minute, you know, in combat, you wouldn't see that. Yeah, but you didn't have the largest ammunition dump on the planet that was about a mile and a half away from your barracks blow up over 12 hours. Okay. And the explosions when they went off were so intense, they would knock the wind out of you if they didn't knock you off your feet. Wow. Okay. And that that is part of the damage, among some other things. So um, they got me in with a sh uh, VA shrink. Okay. And one of the things that came out for us, for me particularly, we were dealing with the Vietnam stuff, okay. But the, the deal was she dug deeper and she says, Look, she says, what's going on here? This one thing that was going on. And I, I, I told him, I says, Look, you do certain kinds of work, you have to keep secrets. Okay. And I explained a little bit of that. And she looked at me and says, keeping secrets like you had to keep had, were their own form of PTSD. Okay. And basically the, the, the secrets, the burden of, okay. Um, you go into the business and the business in, in the second, the second oldest profession, so to speak, the spy business is about amenity for the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay. No one will ever know not your loved ones, not your friends or anything will know what you did for your country. Right. Okay. So you, everything, you know, you have to take to your grave. And that's the, that's the, that's the credo that we live by. And that became, that comes to a point where it becomes a burden. Okay. Now we've seen the amount of kid, the guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. the suicide rates are through the roof. Yes, okay. they are. And uh, the Vietnam vets, the suicide rates we were, were through the roof. Okay, believe me, I considered it many times. And I had the other burden of, I knew I was a transsexual. I volunteered for Vietnam. People right. thought I was crazy. They signed the papers for it. And in the back of my head, my attitude was, I'm going to go to Vietnam and make a man of myself out of myself or I'm going to die trying. Okay. And all I managed really? to do was, yeah, that was my attitude. I had read uh, Dr. Rubin's book back at that time, back in the late 80s, uh, the late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, or a book, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex Were Afraid to Ask. Right. And he, in those days, he painted gay people as ghastly. He's a sense been educated. But he painted transsexuals as mutilated homosexual transvestites. I volunteered. I read that book on a Friday night. I volunteered for NAM on Monday morning. Okay. I can at least, if I get killed, I'll go out honorably and nobody has to know what I am. And he just painted a horrible, monstrous picture of this. Okay. And I discovered over time it wasn't like that. And he was full of baloney up to his ears. So, okay. um, um, all I managed to do, I didn't make a man out of myself, but I certainly came back a decorated war hero, as they say. Um, yeah. uh, so you can't do it. I volunteer for every stupid thing you could think of, you know, thinking maybe this will be the thing that gets me killed, you know. No, it doesn't work that way. Went into Navy and for a couple of got out of the Air Force. And a couple of years later, I joined the Navy because I, I was promised this huge technical training program two or three years worth of school, six year contract. I said, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. A good high tech. And I was a poor kid from upstate New York, a little mill town in upstate New York. So um, I went in the Navy, went through all this training. And uh, what, I, what did I do on a nuclear submarine? I can tell you this. I, my, my discharge papers say I was a senior electronic warfare specialist. Okay. 
that uh, and what that really means was I was trained. I went to school for electronic intelligence and photographic intelligence. Okay, okay. I was trained to take take expert pictures through a periscope. Okay, uh, cool. and I was trained to analyze other people's electronic signatures. Okay, and that's what we did. Can I ask? Sure. Or if you were, because you're tall to be a submariner, but um, so well, is, I'm only five eight. We had guys that were six two that were banging their head on the ceiling. Well, but you know. Chase Klotsky's husband was a submariner. Yeah, he's he, tall, isn't he? Yeah, he was commander. Yeah, <laughs> yes, he was the commander of of Kings Bay. But when you were, you said you're um, capturing signatures, identifying signatures. Um, was that I get the audibly, but was it like identifying the type of vessel it was by the sound, by the audio? No. Uh, oh, the, the, the sonar department, sonar people are, are, are think what we'll call fingerprinting the sound of that, that ship's uh, engine and screw noises. Mm -hmm. Okay. Electronically, we were capable, and I can't tell you with what or how, but we were capable of listening to all of their electronic signatures, their search, their 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 weather of wings, radars, uh, satellite transmissions, whatever they had on that ship, we could we could electronically fingerprint. And okay. it was so precise. And the thing is that people say to us, well, so you just did it to the Soviets. And I said, no, we did it to everybody because your friend today may be your enemy tomorrow and your enemy you today may to be your friend have. tomorrow. Yes. You, 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 you document everybody. Okay. So yes, I, I, I played with all, all the kitchen tools in that kitchen. Okay. And uh, so that was the nature of the work I did and, and went to language school, all this kind of stuff. Um, Went on a number, uh, I, I can say this, I can't say where, but I went on a number of secret missions where we were gone for 75, uh, 75 or 80 or 90 days. Okay. But again, I can't talk about that. Okay. Um, well, I wouldn't ask you to put what, yourself in jeopardy with stuff like that. So, well, yeah, you can't, I can't talk about yeah. that. Just, I can't. wouldn't ask you to. Um, even though it's probably declassified, actually, at this point. In fact, I'm writing the prequel to this this for this spy book. Oh I'm my gosh! People have fans have already written me and say, "What about her first missions and things like this? The stuff in the '80s, not the stuff in the '90s." You know. Yes. So um, I'm actually writing that right now. I'm in I'm All in right. 19 uh, I'm in 1981, 1982 in Algiers, Algeria, and uh. that's 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 where I'm writing the story right now. Um, the bottom line was, um, th this kind of work is very specialized work. And, uh, when I was getting discharged, like Charlie Stewart was, um, it was almost, it was almost a perfect narrative to my discharge from Navy. Okay. I yeah. had come back from, uh, I had just made first class petty officer. Nobody would believe when I, when I told in the command that, my contract was not valid. There was something wrong because they, they screwed me out of a $5,000 reenlistment bonus. And I tried for a year going through normal channels to, to get somebody to look at it properly. And I knew for a case because one of the base lawyers says, I can't represent you, but you have a breach of contract. So there finally, yeah, we did. And so my spouse of that era contacted Congressman Dodd's office there in Connecticut, and they called up the Navy. And I got a call okay. on Christmas morning, 1978, uh, from a senior master in chief in the Bureau of Naval Personnel. And he says, Costa, you don't have a valid contract with the Navy. You were in the Air Force for two years, and for contract purposes, you couldn't have more than four years for pay purposes associated with the Navy to reenlist in this special program. And with your two years, 12 days Air Force time, you have six to 12, six years, 12 days. And we, can't, we can't give you the money. So we have to either let you out or reenlist you on a new contract without that clause. He said, I already got a job offer on the outside. They said, well, fine. Uh, Get your, we'll notify your command to let you out. I just made first class petty officer. I was now one of the senior people in the electronics team. Okay. And we were getting ready to go to Mediterranean. And uh, 
and the CEO says, so-and-so's wife's in the hospital. We just let him, gave him emergency leave. And so-and-so just went, parents or somebody killed in a car wreck got down in Texas someplace, and he's gone. You're the most senior tech of that gang. You got to stay with it. Well, ride us over to, uh, over, to, over, over to Italy. Well, we'll ship you back in a couple of days. So it was like seven or eight days going over. And uh, so they, sh uh, they flew me back from Sardinia. Strange flight when we landed in New York City. There was this horrible storm going on and everything, and they couldn't offload our our, our baggage from the plane because it was like fifty mile an hour winds out there on the tarmac. Oh so we're all stuck in in um, uh, 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 customs hold, right? Because until we can get our baggage and they can look at it or something like that, and then look at our passports, you know, that was it. And so we're sitting there. We finally hour and a half later they're letting us start to go through customs again right you know and, and look at this little asian lady in front of me i said little short lady said, god has anybody ever told you you're a dead ringer for yoko ono and she grinned at me and she nodded over at her husband who was getting his passport stamp it was john lennon and get like out of arm, town arm arm sling from me i guess she had been told she looked like yoko <laughs> yeah so so the deal was, um, I got back and uh, went up to uh, went up to Navy personnel on Monday morning. I came back over the weekend and uh, it pretty much played out the way I wrote it in the book. Okay, and um, the conversation obviously abbreviated and tightened everything. And then the guy says, "There's these guys in suits that want to talk to you." And they took me. They got me in that room, closed the door, and said. 1979. This is 1970. This is actually now at this point is now 1980, January, February, or early February, 1980. Said um, in 1975, we got this picture of you going into a private clinic in Hartford, Connecticut. I said, were you following me around? Says, no, lots of people go from the Navy go there because they're having trouble with their marriages. They got drugs or alcohol problems or something like this. And uh, we, we watch it and we, ran your license plates. We wanted to find out what you do. And we found out you have this high clearance. You're one of the submarines and everything like that. And then the second guy was saying, so, so do you really want to be a woman? <laughs> I said, you, you got a court order to find out what my diagnosis was. You know? Wow. <laughs> and, and that led to a conversation where, um, well, how would you like to come to work for us? You've just been through $300,000 worth of school. The Navy were idiots to let you out for a measly $5,000. I mean, that's jump change. Yeah. And I said, would you like to work for us? I said, just, I could never work for you guys. He said, you're all Princeton, Harvard, and Yale guys. You know, you would never have somebody like me working in your ranks, somebody who might have a sex change in five or 10 years. Yeah. And the one guy looked, the, the one guy, you know, older guy, you know, really looked like a corporate executive and he says, Nope, we couldn't have anybody like you work for us at all, could we? And the other guy looks at me and says, but it'd be the most fantastic cover story because no one would ever believe you could work ever. for us. Yeah. Okay. How could they pass that up? And I said, do you well, I get good paying benefits like I was getting it? He says, oh, for that company? I said, you know I was going to those guys? Yeah. yeah. So, and so uh, I signed up. And uh, they put me together with a tutor his name isn't dr sardaroff like it is in the book um and um but he did he i think in the book i mentioned uh first time uh charles meets him he says god this guy looks like john houseman right you know yeah. and he did <laughs> he looked like he came into the room he looked like john houseman as we remember him from paper chase that gruff thing right. i'm going to make you all into lawyers you know and this yeah. guy's attitude is, I'm going to make you into a spy, you know? So um, this was a tutoring okay, I thing. have to, Go I ahead. have to stop you because Please. it's, um, your mindset is not a lot different now than it was then. It's really not. Your, your daring may do, as it were, right? You're still the same person as that kid that was going in and learning all this stuff. And I just find it so fun. I mean, I'm pretty sure you found it fun that you were going to get all this money and all, yeah, you know, all this pay and all this 
you know, set up to be able to do what you're really good at mm-hmm. and you're still on the government dime. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, that was the know. fun part about it. But the, the, the other goofy part about it was um, he sent me down and he says, we're going to teach you to be a Sovietologist. I found that word interesting. And uh, and basically, he says, it's not just about speaking the language. He says, yeah, I, he, he asked me to speak a couple words to him. And I, I did. And he says, oh, you speak it like a clumsy foreigner and you got a slight northern accent, you know. And, uh, and but he says, I'm going to train you, teach you everything. A year from now, you're, you're going to be able to sit down and read the morning edition of, of, of the Soviet Union's Pravda newspaper. Yeah. As easily as you can read the New York Times right now. Okay. And you're going to understand the cultural context of everything in there because I'm going to teach it to you because I was born in Murmansk. I'm a former Soviet. Okay. So he he had, he had several of us that he taught and he was uh, tutoring. And um, uh, that's how it went down. Um Beyond that, I can't get into certain details, but the the deal was the 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 actual agency that we work for. I don't think anybody's ever heard of. You know, probably won't hear of. And I had to change the name in the book, obviously. Okay, right. But the flavor is after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we realized that CIA assets that were deep undercover couldn't help us when we were almost at a crisis point of the, you know, both sides were armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons over Cuba and they were getting ready to push the bloody button. Yeah. Okay. And what they figured out was they need more back channels and the agency CIA type assets were trained to go in there and do special short-term special missions. These folks were training people for long-term deep immersion assignments to establish back channels, friendships and relationships. Okay. And some of those relationships left as as, as you'll find out towards the end of the book, they said a lifetime. Okay. And, um, the, the first story, and again, this is my shrink talking. Tell it. Tell it. You don't, maybe you don't have to publish it, but tell it. So actually, yeah. the first story I wrote, I'm a short story writer, so I, yeah. I, I stay with my form. The first story that I actually wrote ended up being the last story in the book. Okay. They called her out of retirement. And another counterpart that she had worked with out of retirement. Well, I can easily say that you've read the book up to the point you, you read the part about Chernobyl. Mm-hmm. Okay. The lady who is on, who is really on your geese off and air are pals, still pals today. Okay. Right. And we talk all the time on Facebook. Okay. Um, so the, the deal was, um, uh, these people, these we have these relationships with people, and they called us both out of retirement. And neither one of us had been active since around 2010, 2011. Yeah. And they said, we need you. I said, why do you need us? Said, You're still breathing. So, yeah, we'd like to stay that way, you know. And the <laughs> bottom, you know, the bottom line was, you know, there's this, there's this guy that wants to defect. I said, nobody defects from there anymore. He says, huh, this guy was pretty high up and she was, he's sick of Putin. Oh my. He says, we're not going to Russia. I said, wait a minute, Russia and Ukraine are in a war. We're not going back to Russia. Maybe, you know, I'm not going back in that country after all that, all this time. And he says, no, no, he comes to Canada on a regular basis to Ontario. And he's like, you trade at this shape. So all you got to do is throw him in a car and bring him across the border and show him a, he'll, he'll see you. He'll recognize a safe, friendly face, somebody he knows, and he'll come with you willingly. He's passed notes to the Canadians. He would like a life in the United States. And that was the flavor of it. And so I wrote, I wrote that story first since it was the freshest in my mind. Yeah. And, I guarantee you, uh, I think you, you will find it interesting. 
Well, so far I'm finding everything interesting. <laughs> so that doesn't surprise me, but you know, something that, um, I think is going to surprise people about that is that Chernobyl is not a, a past tense thing. Oh no, I read somebody sent me an article this morning says, Hey, they they found back they found bacteria and fungus over there. It's actually thriving in the radiation. <laughs> right. So, you know, I I mean, I I love reading these those things. I I am a news you know peruser. I, I look for odd weird cool things because I think that's fun. I need to put yeah. my disclaimer in here. Everything I yeah. just said never happened. In fact, it says it in the book. This is a figment of my imagination. Of okay? course it is. Please, this is all a figment of my imagination. Of course it is. No, Chernobyl was, Chernobyl was interesting. <laughs> I can only imagine. You know, and I sit there now and I look at... Um, Oh, the Japanese, Fiji, Fiji, the Say reactor that. that's still leaking. Yeah. What? Fukushima. Fukushima. You know, yeah, yeah. I sit there and I look at that and I'm like, there's so many, everybody thought that Chernobyl could be an extinction event because nobody was really that familiar with, with that. It's contained environment. It's yeah. contained. They put a sarcophagus over it, so to speak. Yeah. For, and Fukushima sure is, the, is the one that's it's not so great. <laughs> it's it's yeah. leaking all over the Pacific, or you know. So. And when when I I mean because I won't eat out of the Pacific, I do not buy yeah. anything yeah. out of the Pacific, and because I do research, and I mean it's part of my job with fate to be able to have a working knowledge of things in case I run across somebody like you that knows these things and wants to have a conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, every time I talk with someone, especially people in the know, and I say, you know, I think Fukushima is actually an extinction level event. Nobody counters that. Oh, Nobody. No, they don't. They don't. Because they believe that too. And you can't, I mean, when you get, fish that have other fish attached to them, you know, like born this way. It's just kind of like, okay, what are we, what are we mutating in the deep, deep sea that's going to arise <laughs> at some point? Yeah, we got, oh, Godzilla. we got dinosaurs, <laughs> Godzilla. And, but you know, it's a reason that's a Japanese movie, right? So, yeah. um, but it's all this stuff is real. All the the problems that people who are in your position, the position you were in, people have to deal with these things. Somebody has to go in there and, you know, save the world from ourselves. I, and I please understand on that mission, I was strictly a translator. Me and Anya were strictly translators. Well, I mean, that's fine. Translation, but I've taken, a, I've taken a light lifetime dose if that means anything, you know. Right, I still well, have, I, I have been you know, what's funny is you know, my hair on this light, I, I appear very gray for 72, but actually, if you see me out, out of extra external light, I've actually got a lot of my hair color, amazingly enough. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't processed my hair since uh 97, but the goofy thing is, is that um. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Neither Anya and I, we were comparing, you know, the, no, here, I don't have it here. You know, you know, like the little medicine cups you get with, uh, like with the uh, cough medicine. Yes. All right. Okay. I keep those. And that's what I put my pills every morning into. Right. One day, about two weeks ago, uh, uh, Anya put hers up. Okay. That's not a real name. Okay. But that's a mission name. So uh, Anya put her pills up and she took a picture clicking right down in the cup. And I sat there and said, well, that's her this, that's this, that's this, that's this, that's this. Wow, I got all those. <laughs> I took a picture of mine and sent it back there and said, yeah, guess where we were, you know. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, together, same same exposure. Yeah, similar stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, just, you know, having a conversation, um, it's later in the book, having a conversation with someone else who was there from, the Soviet side of it, okay, and 
uh, there's one scene where Moira is having Moira in her cover identity as Mashenka is mm-hmm. having is in the um, um, American Cafe on Capitol Hill in Washington D.C. Right. And uh, this is the early '90s, and she's having this um, she's having lunch with this guy. He's currently the air attaché at the Soviet embassy. I actually, at that point, it was the, they were already the Federation, they were already the Russian Federation. Okay. And they were having, they had, and he says, what's good? And he says, she looks at him and he says, uh, I'm going to be having a Cobb salad. And he says, yeah, my doctor says no more forest, forest cake either, you know, so, okay, I'll have a Cobb salad. And we both drink iced tea. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, we talked about the idea of dessert. And my earplug just popped out here. Hang on. Okay. We're, we're having des- going to have dessert. And he says, oh, all this stuff looks good, and I can't have any of it. And I said, how about, Moira says this, or, uh, Mishenko says this, um, how about we split a piece of cheesecake? Good. So they're splitting a piece of cheesecake, one cheese. He's cheesecake. And during the course of having it, they're discussing the fact that how many people that they knew that have died from the radiation at Chernobyl. Right. Okay. Too many. And, oh, our diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we got diabetes, you know. So we're going through, the, they're going through this whole hoop in the story. And there's just one little piece of cheesecake left, about the size of a postage stamp. And he looks at Mashenka and he says, That's our cover name. He looks at Mashenka and says, you're getting ready to go to St. Petersburg for two years. You're supposed to be a drama teacher. He says, you go be a really good drama teacher, but no. And he doesn't say the word, and she says it back to him in Russian. Shurkis? Hijinks? You know, and and he says, yes, no shurkis. Just go be a good drama teacher. And he, she says to him, I give you my word, splits the piece of that little piece of cheesecake between them. I says, let's toast ourselves on this poisonous piece of cheesecake. These were diabetics. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so you, you get a flavor about that kind of thing. As I said, I was never there. It's all figment of my imagination. Well, you know, you've got a great imagination. But one of the things that and I don't want you to go too deep because I have not gotten there yet. I'll see, okay, I won't because you haven't got there yet. Okay. Yeah. But, but I can give you. I can. I can. I can give you. I can give you uh, trailer highlights, though. Okay. Well, I want trailer highlights on the the UFO aspect. Okay. Um, okay. That is. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay. This, if you if you've noticed in the story, it seems like I've taught. I t- told a short story. And then I told a longer short story. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's my form. I'm used to writing murder mysteries and ghost stories and that type of thing. So I, I did this instead of in chapters, I did it in aspects of her life over a period of 44 years. Okay. To present. And um, so what happens every now and then, especially if you're in, in that business and you're cleared very, rather seriously. Every now and then, some old spy dies someplace, and the, fa- the grandkids find a box in the attic, and it's got a whole bunch of stuff that should not be there. So somebody with a, a cl- agency clearance has to go in there, paw through it, and see if there's anything that's still sensitive. Yes. Okay. Familiar with that. Um, uh, I'm as I said, I'm writing the prequel story. Um, I've got. I may. Mean, Saving my memory, I've been able, I printed down some stuff from the CIA website that's now declassified that backs up everything that I'm writing in the book. Okay. Because I, the way I remember it, but it was very classified when I was dealing with it. Okay. But I actually had some of it all pinned up here on the on my board. You know, uh, when I was writing one aspect of the story, because I wanted it right there where I could look at it. You know? um, so the question was how that happened. Okay. So, Library of Congress, 
uh, they found buried in someplace in uh, the librarians, the library calendars, found this package wrapped up, what they call security double wrapped. Mm -hmm. And it said, it, it found, uh, found after the death of this particular person, okay, um, it, it you yeah. know it, you know it this is what it is and you open up the first wrapping and there's another even more strict classification thing saying this is a special type of classification and they don't know what to do with it so we take it into a security area we get another agency involved with it okay to right. help sanitize the material and everything and figure out what it is and they start figuring out oh my god this woman worked on the h-bomb for god's sakes you know and maybe maybe she was afraid they were going to erase her contributions to it because she was a woman okay mm -hmm. and yeah. and it when there's a whole bunch of world war ii wire recordings in there before we had cassettes before we had magnetic tape we had wire recordings and it starts talking about the fact that these, these visitors from out of town, from out of, from not on our planet, were real, and they've yeah. been coming here for forty thousand years, you know, and that's the flavor of it. And um, we'll say Moira at that point thinks uh, it's baloney. There's no such thing. It's that's cook, cookie crackpot stuff. Okay. Right. And and slowly she starts saying, Holy God, this stuff is real. Okay. But of course so, she never actually saw that. No, no, never, never, ever. Um, so you, you, what troubled me when I wrote that, I had to own up to the fact that, you know, the, the story I talk about the first time I saw a UFO. Okay, yeah, I did see one when I was uh, about 12 years old with my parents. I was fascinated by it. But as I got a little bit older, you know, into my teens, things like this, you know, it's cookie crackpot stuff. Right. Okay. I, because I really didn't have, I wasn't invested in it. Okay. Until you get to sanitize something that almost nobody will ever see. And so that, that gives you an idea of what happens and uh -huh. um and since you're not done with that chapter yet i am that that movement i'm not going to tell you where where it goes and who sits on it yeah but well, i'm pretty sure I know who sits on it pardon me i said i'm pretty sure i know who sits on it oh i mean these guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah well okay. i mean you and i have been around the ufo yeah. community enough that we know who fights so hard to make sure that thing or to try to make sure that things don't see the light of day. Yeah. I mean, you know, the first, the first edition of fate magazine, the cover was Kenneth Arnold's UFOs yeah. and you know, the flying discs look, look like saucers. Whoa, whoa, flying saucers. So, you know, there have been so many people, the initial foray into UFOs didn't get sanitized quite as fast and the information got out. There's, um, you know, there was an island, Murray Island, I think is the name of it, where they were coming down on, on ships. They were in distress and coming down and they have a festival there but you know all these people because ufology is i mean i'm a i'm a paranormal investigator i love doing that but ufology is a field that i like to study okay Th that's why agreed. agreed i i love i love investigations but i really get off on the whole, you know, yeah, they're here. I mean, you know, Tom Conwell, our friend that we were talking about, he is the person who first showed me his databases. We've been talking since he started making them. Yep. And, you know, when he first had his, I have one of the, the first maps 
you know, of his map. And well, he used he used the white book to build some of it. Yeah. Or white book. I mean, yeah. You know, it's just so amazing it's cool, to me. It's cool stuff. The goofy thing about all of that. Um, okay, why did I produce like the white and the pink book and the fifty individual yeah. state books? Okay, well, blame it on the profession. Yeah. Uh, I was trained to be an analyst. Yes. That's what Jack Ryan was in the Tom Clancy books. He was an analyst. Yes. He really wasn't a field operative, except he didn't every plan now and then he, he, he no, didn't plan to be ever matter expert. Okay. Yeah. And I just when it got shot at a lot, and believe me, I know where he's coming from with that. But uh, th that's the deal. Um, and, and so what you're getting is somebody who wasn't on the inside track taking, pu uh, taking public data, but with the inside track type skills saying, mm -hmm. let's do, let's, it's, let's analyze this stuff unlike anything that's ever yes. been put out. Yes. So blame the government who trained me to do such things. <laughs> And for training, I mean, because he was military. Yeah. And I have found that with, with UFOlogy, okay, that if somebody is ex-military, they're a lot more open to this topic. And... Oh, you see a lot of strange things when you're on... Well, especially when you're... When you're, yeah, you know, one of my friends that really wasn't into what I was doing was somebody that went to Key West with when I did a lot. And he was in the Navy and he was in the Indian Ocean a lot. And we think we have activity. He's like, the USOs in the Indian Ocean are astounding. There is constant, constant activity. I've heard that. And now I want to go to the Indian Ocean and just hang out for a while, you know, on a ship. My husband would never let me do that, but it's a good thought. But um, because he wouldn't want to go. <laughs> so, but I just. You know what happened? That, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. No, sorry. no, go ahead. Do you I know, know when, what happened? What? When I physically got the book out. Yeah. Um, my shrink, I, I sent her a copy and she went through it and it's somebody else on those pages, but it reads too bloody true. Right. And so she says, you're going to get in trouble for it. And I says, Hey, read the disclaimer in front. I was never there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very clever disclaimer too. I'm just going to put that out there. It is. So, I mean, it's uh, but, really well done. There are other there are other books that have a disclaimer not unlike that. Okay. Yes, I know. But the, the the deal the deal is is that you're in that touchy area. You take security oaths, and you're not supposed to say anything. But some, actually, except for nuclear stuff, and that's what they're hooking all these deep secret guys. You know, they hooked it yeah. into the Atomic Energy Act, and that doesn't automatically declassify. You know, yeah. and it was clever to do them to do it, but as I. I personally have some disdain because they used the, that type of classification for something it wasn't intended for. Yeah. Okay. To hide something to the point where almost nobody can touch it. You know? Um, but, uh, but like I said, most of the stuff I dealt with a uh, long time. The only reason they used to put 50 year, like world war two was like a few years ago. We only started seeing true stories from world war two, you know, spy yes. stuff, things like this is because back in the day, most of us didn't make it past 60 years old. And the idea, if they classify something for 50 years, there's a very good chance we'll all be dead before somebody wants to take revenge on us or our families. You know, that kind right. of thing, you know, um, granted, I, I might, the, my training been through all kinds of school and that gets talked about later. And mm -hmm. the, I'm going to, I'll probably spill one little joke for you real quick. Um, I've been through all kinds of school. I know 20 ways to kill you, as they say. And the hardest school I ever went to was they put me through eight weeks of charm school. <laughs> and I had to learn to dance backward in heels. Because I learned to waltz when I was a kid with my mom after school. Yeah. She didn't want to make a fool of my, I didn't want me to make a fool of myself with a girl dating in high school class or in college. And, the, the yeah. deal of that was um, 
suddenly I was had to go on an assignment where I had to be a bit more upper crust about my training. They put me through extensive charm school. And oh, by the way, one day I had a meltdown as I don't know how to dance backwards in heels. Ginger Rogers did everything he, uh, Fred Astaire did, but did it backwards in heels, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's, it, it gets interesting. And when you get to that part of the book, you realize where the real stress of the PTSD comes in. I'm supposed to be anonymous. I'm not here. I'm invisible. Hey, this is something you'll appreciate. Women, we're invisible. The older you get, the more invisible you are. That's true. Okay. 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 And as somebody who's been a girl for 36 years, I learned right. that very quickly. Okay. Really? And to some, yeah, that was something that was a, 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 an odd awakening for me a long time ago. And there's even a comment back in the last chapter of the books, uh, Anya is saying to Mashenka, just, hey, we're old ladies now. We're even more invisible. Nobody will ever see us. We're harmless. You know, we can get away with murder, you know. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, Thing is, uh, I do that in the front of the book. I mentioned I, I did a dedication to the women spies that that we won't know yeah. and we'll never know because yeah. they did their job so well that they pe pe agencies erase their existence. That type of thing. Of course, that's the patriarchy, but um, that rots. But well, on, that, that's the of, deal. Go ahead. It's kind of like you know during the World Wars when all of the men were shipped out and the women were running the munitions factories and they were running the farms and they were running the businesses. And then, you know, they were, you know, Rosie, the Riveter, every, the women saved yeah. our country while the men were saving everyone else. And yet when the men came back, the women were kicked back out. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's Go the home same. To your homes and children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My and told me about that, you know, you know, it, to me, there's a lot of heroes in armed conflict. Yeah. It's not just the soldiers that are, you know, on the battlefields. It's also the people, you know, the spooks that do what you were doing. It's the, the people who, you know, are willing to put their professional life aside as positions that go and, and take care of people. It's, there's so much involved that doesn't. Did spooks offend you? Say it again. Did it offend you when I said spooks like spies? No, no, no. Okay. I just didn't want to, but you know, it's just so, um, there's so many people involved in making the world a safer place, ostensibly a safer place. Sometimes it doesn't always work out. No, I but, no, I get that. You know. You know, another term we use among ourselves sometimes it used to be uh, the invisible people. Yeah. Remember, we were supposed to be, you know, no one's supposed to know what we do, you know. Mm -hmm. So the flavor is is that um, uh, the, the words are coming hard here. Bear with me for a moment. It's okay. Um, invisible in the sense that you're not supposed to be visible. You have this high degree of anonymity. Okay. I was never there, as they say. Okay. Right. But then you find yourself in a situation, and you'll find this out with Mashenka. Uh, oh, by the way, for the audience, the character's name is Mashenka Irina Petrova. Okay. And uh, she, um, she finds herself in a situation where they have put her in a mission where the intent was for her to make a splash on both sides of the Neva River. That's the river in St. Petersburg. Okay. You know, and she suddenly has this high press visibility. Okay. And she is constantly saying to herself, this is one of those PTSD hooks, you know, I'm supposed to be anonymous. I'm supposed to be anonymous. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be this person and everybody knowing. She goes on and does a, 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 the lady who did an interview with her in Washington, D.C., in, in, in context of her cover identity, she left that, she left that interview, sat in the back of the, of the taxi, and thought to herself, there, beautiful spy craft, 
I just planted a cover story and the world's going to know about it. Okay. Right. Uh, it, it's, it, it's how it works. Okay. And you don't, sometimes you have, you wonder how, how some stories get in the news because they sound so absurd. That's how they get in the news. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it, it, that part, that, that part is kind of goofy. And like I said, my shrink read through this thing and she said, are you sure you're not going to get in trouble? I said, no, I ran it through by, by people. you'll notice the top of the, the top of the stories, like the header will always say a particular date range, early nineties, late eighties, mm -hmm. it, it, no t dates, time and places for the yeah. most part. Yeah. And you know, I'm sorry. I love spycraft. I love reading about it. I love learning about it. I, I admire people who use it to, to narrate their stories. Um, there's a guy named Micah Dank who wrote a series of books. I've heard and the it's name. About, okay. Well, he is, he's also a radio host. He's brilliant. I love him to pieces. I've interviewed him a couple of times too, but he did books like seven books um, so centered around young people that were on a quest and the character development and the necessary skill sets changing as they're going through there. But um, it was really an amazing thing because he was, and he's not done this. He doesn't have your background. And yet he's writing about going into, into foreign countries on a quest to find something and implementing this, these skill, you know, the skill hmm. craft. I get it. And yeah. so this is like, he's writing from a past life, <laughs> right? Yes. Cause it's just so weird when, because I like that stuff. So I look for it and I find it. And, you know, when you told me about this book, I was just like, yes, please because I know enough about your background to think that this was going to be insight to you. And, and I like you. So that was going to be a fun side of it. But I know that you said that you checked all this out and I know that, um, that you're comfortable with where it's gone with being able to, to get that out. I'm pretty sure it's pretty damn liberating to be getting that out too, because it's quite an experience. Well, not just that it's quite an experiential life that you've yeah. led. And there's a lot of layers to the onion being peeled back here. That was the scary part for me. Yeah. That, that had was to be the very scary part. You're vulnerable. You're yeah. letting yourself be vulnerable through this. And I think that's really something that, because I know you, I know how hard that had to be. I feel like it was who've read, read the things recently and that have known me a long time. Mm -hmm. And they would say, Oh, is that why you would disappear for six months at a time? We just thought you fell off the social circles or, or you were working on a new play at the local community theater or something like that. And we just didn't see you. And they started putting the pieces <laughs> together. Oh my God, you, you were taking off for six months or three months or whatever, yeah. you know. Um, my family, um, my blood family, who doesn't really talk to me, uh, uh, I got a copy to them. And they don't believe a word of it. Yeah. Which is fine. Actually, it's wonderful. They don't believe a word of it. <laughs> if they don't believe it, then maybe the people, <laughs> you know. On the other hand, my brother read the damn thing. He says, oh, my God, that explains everything. My brother, New York State changes put gun laws a few number of years ago. And he had an AK-47, which is the rifle they had, the, the Viet Cong had. It was a Russian rifle. And... um he had bought one. He was very proud of it. He showed it off to me and 
I'm sorry, I'm an ex Vietnam vet. And going, eh, you know, yeah, I've seen these. Yeah. You know? And he was really showing it off to me. And he went outside to get something and he came back and he found it on the dining room table, completely field stripped and laid all out there for him. <laughs> and and um, so when this book came out, Mom, I told you, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, you know, there's there's cute little aspects like that. Um, uh, in the last movement of the thing, uh, there's a thing where I had to go do speak at a metaphysical conference out in the Midwest. Okay. Yeah. And I literally started. They looked across the parking lot at each other. They had not seen each other for 38 years. Stati uh, uh, um, protocol wise, they shouldn't ever be in the same state, county, definitely not the same city. And here they are in the same bed and breakfast. Wow. Okay. And it was me and Anya. We hadn't seen each other in 36, 38 years, something like that. And uh, so it, it, it was, you, you see, you'll see some drama there with that. Um, and uh, so we wrote that as it, as it played out. It was, I, I was keeping it in my diary. <laughs> yeah. That's so, fun. So it, it's goofy. And, you know, there, there are people, there were people when I first came out with UFO book or started writing a UFO column. Yeah. They were saying, where the hell did this chick come from? To fall out of the sky. I heard several people use a term like that. Is who knows this much about it? We haven't heard of them. Okay. Right. And so this this was that was a that was probably the toughest line for me to walk. I could see that. Yeah. Because I I I couldn't ex explain my perspective not so much my definite knowledge on any specific case but my perspective and my view and then my analysis skills mm -hmm. okay uh, and i know a long time ago had i known george knapp when the soviet union fell and he went over to russia had i known he was going over there i would have volunteered to go over and translate for him for god's sakes right you know but i didn't know so well, I've got to think that you're going to have a hard time topping this because, because the, the whole experience, if people did not know this about you or didn't recognize the strength of character that this created in you, you know, then I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of people the next time we're at a place together that are going, oh, Cheryl, oh, Cheryl. Yeah. Well, about this. And what did you and how did you and did you really? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be quite not, a time. Never, yet. I was never there. I know. But. They're like me, <laughs> right? They read between the, <laughs> the lines. People, the people in ufology that we run around are just like us, you know. So, you know, it's going to be quite an Linda, interesting. My wife, Linda, is technically my publisher. Yeah. Okay. So we tend to keep it very separate until I have something finished. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, I gave her, I went and printed off a, a manuscript copy. Okay. I ran, I went up to Kinko's and, and ran one off. Right. Brought it in. Right. And it wasn't Kinko's office max or something. You know? And I brought it, I brought it home, put it in a three ring binder for her. And she says, okay, I'll get around to reading it in a couple of days. And she took a four day weekend, uh, holiday weekend, said to sit down and read it. And she had read the first two movements so she read about Charlie getting out of the Navy. She read about uh, the Chernobyl thing. And she came in for the afternoon nap we sometimes take. Okay. She came in the bedroom, laid down in the bed. We cover up with this light shot type of thing. She says, she says, you know, when I was in grade school, there was this idea that because of the Cold War, 
my advanced class, we were like an advanced placement class in like early grade school. And our city school district was training the best and brightest to be the survivors. And they were teaching us Cyrillic. They were teaching us um, uh, Cyrillic along with our English and all this kind of stuff, right? Just, I don't remember a lot of my Russian, but she says, holy shit, Cheryl, I didn't know you you went to language school. I said, yeah, I kind of kept it to myself. And, and is it, that rattled her because here's somebody I've been married to for 20 years and she didn't know this side of me. Yeah. Okay. It didn't, I asked her, does that scare you? I mean, did, that, did I keep something from you I should have told you about? And, and she, the more she got into the book, she said, no, no. I see you all through the whole book, mm-hmm. you know, and no, I'm not worried about it. There's some things you had to keep to yourself. So, yeah. Well, but every every military spouse knows during that. during service or after knows that there are going to be things that you just can't address. And True. I mean, that's why, especially I think for families where the spouse that served comes back with such extreme PTSD that they're waking up screaming that they're, you know, doing all of the stuff that goes with that. Then, um, you know, I can't imagine that being David and me not knowing what it is so that I can help him with it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways that spouses, suffer through that and i think that even though it doesn't appear that you were reacting in that way there's a lot of stuff that will alter your personality based on your life experience i know that oh yeah everybody has that well people ask me why i spent seven years in a buddhist monastery yeah okay you're healing well well, partly that yeah ran away one well no it wasn't completely that they picked me out of a crowd of a hundred people and said, we know you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I knew, that was, I knew that. that was, that was important for me to, you know, to explore that. Had I been this monk back in 19, early 19th century Tibet. Okay, fine. Yeah. And I, I got to the bottom of it. Okay. But while I was there, see what we don't talk about in our gun culture here in the United States, we solve everything in the movies with guns, you know, and all like this stuff. And, What nobody ever talks about, especially if you've shot someone, especially Mm -hmm. if you've killed someone. Yeah. Um, People, it's like a Twilight Zone episode. Rod Sterling had one like this, you know, where the dead people were in the mirror when the guy is shaving in the morning, you know. Yeah. And 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 I've talked to some other vets, and and quietly and coyly they say, "Yeah, that they're with me." Yeah. Okay. And it took me that time, seven years in that monastery to develop the skills. Didn't handle all the PTSD, but it gave me the skills to make peace with those six sets of eyes that were looking back at me. Right. And I was able to make peace with them. And in my case, I it meant to. I sat down, each one of them, I gave them kind of a name and every one of them, over a period of about three months, I did the high passage rites for each one of them as if it was someone's doing the proper good Buddhist burial, so to speak, you know, right. and I did that. And one by one, they disappeared. That's how I managed it. It was, a, it was less a psychological problem and more of a spiritual problem for me. I could see that. That would be for me. And I mean... If- Unfortunately, in the in the clandestine business, I never had to kill anybody. Okay, I was very fortunate in that in that regard. I, I never the nature of our business was to go out there and 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 make good friends and be pals with people, so that if something goes hell goes to hell in a hand basket, you got somebody to call up and you know, we'll say in the Soviet Union and say, "Can you go bend some ears?" You know. And that type of thing. It, 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 there was this whole idea you had to make these con, have these contacts, relationships, relationships, and some of these relationships were forged, and as they say, forged in fire, so to speak. 
and right. last a lifetime. And the book literally, this book literally ends with the story of a, a friendship forged over almost uh, almost 30 or 40 years. You know, so it, it was, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting way of looking at, most people don't get to have that kind of a, a friendship and a relationship, that type of thing. So again, I was never there. Yes. Yeah, so. Of course not. Figment of my imagination. Yeah. Well, you know, you just have to pull things out of the air to write about them sometimes. Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have been informed that the um, International Spy Museum in D.C. has a copy of my book now. <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. Yeah. So, um, but I am writing the prequel, which is interesting. It's um, it's pretty much all set in the eighties, and um, and and you know after chernobyl you know what happened to the spouse okay yeah. in 86 um uh we get to tell you she got drafted into the service with 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 moira okay and it's a cute story how it happened and she ended up working uh she was loaned out by the agency to uh a uh AISE, which is the Italian intelligence service, because she speaks she speaks Italian like a native, mm -hmm. and uh, she she on her mother's mother and grandmother's knee, you know, and uh, she worked for them. And when I was on assignment in Algeria in 81, 82, almost two years, um, the agency we couldn't fly home and be our regular selves, but gee. Svetlana got to go and fall in love with this nice Sardinian chick. Okay, they had to yeah. do it. In, they had to do it in their cover identities, but they got the seeds that they're about every four to six months. You know, so that's kind of the, the flavor of that story that I'm telling right now of how they did that. And then, uh, oh, I'm sanitizing a couple of other ones that I can tell, but they're all going to be set in the 80s since most of the stuff here was, except for the Chernobyl and her getting recruited, everything was set in the 90s, right. early 2000s. Well, the recruitment was really interesting. You did a good job with that. But I don't, um, I can't believe, I still can't believe you did that. I really think that you did such a good job but you always do but I was really when I started reading it I was just kind of like I know this person I know this person yeah. I know that thought process this is interesting and for somebody that wasn't there you had a very good perception of what it would have been like so, now you sound like my writing professor from college. You know, she, right. <laughs> she, she went through it and was going to critique it. And she says, oh, I always knew there was something deeper going on inside. <laughs> so, well, I am, I am, I am not critiquing. I'm just saying that you can see the stuff. How hard was it when you started coming back and, you had to write the scenes that were very uncomfortable yeah, you know, because there are some mm -hmm. and when you it's so obvious that it's not pure fiction mm. you know in the writing it's very i don't really know it's not emotion it's not you know, any kind of woo or anything like that. It's just. I think in some cases, some for people have said, I gave them enough information. So when an issue came up, they were in bed with me and felt the same fear that I was going through. Great okay. description. Yeah. Okay, they, they experienced that kind of, oh, my God, she shouldn't be in that situation, you know. Um, yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, you're reading the thing there with the 
World War II wire recordings. Okay, um, there's going to be a point there where those two those two investigators are on the run, mm-hmm. okay, for their lives, and uh, you're going to find out. And again, this is from these stories from the '80s. That they, it's not in there, but uh, they they go to a safe house, and they have, the safe house happens to be over in it's in Silver Spring, Maryland, up over top of an Ethiopian restaurant, and uh, uh, Moira goes in. She's not in cover identity; she's just doing her job, normal day to day job in, in the in the intel business, and with this lady from this other agency, and she walks into the drags this lady into the Ethiopian restaurant and says, thought, and walks in, looks at the lady running the place says, and Devanish, da 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 and starts running off in, the, in, uh, in uh, Ethiopian Amharic. And um, <laughs> lady upstairs in my apartment is from Ethiopia. And I saw her really? come out with her four-year-old son couple, uh, about three months ago. And, and I, I, I could tell by looking at her, she was Ethiopian. Okay. Mm-hmm. They have a very distinctive look in their eyes. And yeah. I, I, I greet her in, in, in Devonish. And she looked back at me, Da-da-da. you know, and, and we exchanged a couple of prison fees. And I, I kneeled down on the floor to talk to her four year old down. And, and, uh, and I, and I had heard someone tell me his name was Jorel, you know, but being a little comic book Superman fan, that, that kind of yeah. resonated with me, you know, but, um, uh, so, her husband was still out of the country for a time. And then just a few months ago, he moved back. The grandparents were coming over and watching the kid when she was out working. So um, uh, I, but I got in the elevator a couple of days ago and there she was standing there. And there was, uh, there was uh, uh, her little son, Jarrell and her husband, Wooby shot. And the, the grandmother was sitting there and I looked back at the grandmother ah, in, in Devonish, you know, and, ah, da, 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 you know, and it's, it's, very strange. She cornered me in the parking lot recently. She says, "How did you learn a mark? Where did you go to learn a mark?" Okay, and I said, "I really can't tell you." <laughs> okay, but that's one of those eighties, eighties, early nineties missions, you know. Right. Um, and that was easy. It was that was just I was doing courier duty. Okay, and flying. And I don't get into it, but flying courier packages from Bahrain down to Al Sababa about once a week and back. Okay, during their Ethiopian civil war. <laughs> so <laughs> but I picked to up, hide that though. I I I picked up a huge amount of it. But not enough to really be conversational. Much, not much more than how to find the restroom, how to find the restaurant, how to find the police department, where's the airport, you know, how do I get a cab, you know, that kind of functional stuff. You know, you, you go on a cruise, it's good to know that the toilets are called baños, you know, you know, yeah. if you're going on the Caribbean cruise or Mexican cruise, whatever, you know. So it's that kind of stuff. But a mm-hmm. lot of it stayed with me because over the year, um, back in uh, the back in the ninety. Uh, I can't say it there. Back in the early, I always say back in the nineties, it was very yeah, good. No, you know what? This is actually <laughs> this was this is in 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 eighty nine ish time frame. Right. Um, I knew some people at the Ethiopian Embassy in DC. Okay, and uh, in in the course of knowing them, I picked up a lot more. Mark, uh, one of the guys brought his mother over to go to NIH to have some medical stuff down on a leg and I get to be fond friends with his mother. Okay. Okay. And the goofy thing about that was that was I got where I get my first dose of matriarchy. A matriarchal really? culture. Okay. What's this mean? I'm talking to her and he says, uh, okay, I talked about her son. Okay. And he says, uh, so how many children do you have? And Mimi looks at me and she says, Oh, I have 13 children. I said, wow. Well, where's your husband? Or, you know, she looked at me straight. She says, well, "Where's your, where the husband to, to the children?" So which one? Said, what do you mean? He says, "Oh, I've had, they, I have thirteen children. They each had a father." Matriarchal culture. She t- she sat down over dinner. 
I'm sitting there eating in Jira, and she's sitting there telling me, explaining to me how the property is passed down to the woman, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, very different culture. Very eye, very, very eye opening to a new woman, so to speak. Yeah. So, uh, some people say, you know, considering the PTSD aspects and all this stuff, you know, do you regret any of it? I says, no, I've had the most fantastic adventure any, anybody could possibly think of, you know, and I have met some of the most wonderful people that you can possibly think of. Yeah. So it, it, I, I can't, can't dismiss any of it. it was, look, sometimes it's, an, it's, it's a disaster just going to the freaking supermarket. Okay. Yeah. I had somebody try to rob me in a parking lot about three months ago, the supermarket. Oh, I didn't right? know that. No, no, most people don't. I, and I looked at the guy and he says, you know, you really don't want to do this. He says, why not? And I says, well, first thing, he says, I don't have anything of real, real values. Everything's on plastic for the most part. There might be $5 worth of, you know, incidental money in my purse, point one. Point two, you don't want to have to sit in the emergency room this afternoon and explain to the emergency room staff and the police why this 72-year-old lady broke both your arms. Okay. And yeah. he says, you can't do that. And then and I looked at him and said, do you know what I used to do for a living? <laughs> and he just <laughs> toddled away. Okay. After yeah. I told him. So, uh, again, you know, a lot of people think you, you learn all this stuff. You're going to, no, you don't, you don't. It's a last resort to use it, to, to, to use the violence. I don't believe well, in using it. Violence. It should always be. Yeah. Um, I get that. You make the business, the, the part of the business that we were in, the people, my colleagues were in, it was establishing relationships and you did more spy business over dinner and a good, a good bottle of wine sometimes. Okay. Or quite literally out there playing golf with them. And I can't play That's golf. That's how diplomacy beans. works. It's how diplomacy works. Okay, yeah. um, so it, it that's the, that's see that's the other thing I've gotten compliments. My 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 writing professor made a comment about the book. She says, "Holy God!" She says, "How do I want to say this?" Um, she makes a comment. She says, "All the spy movies I've ever seen, it's always like James Bond there with that big." Cannon of a gun. He's in a tuxedo and a couple of women in eye candy type of thing. And it's all fist fights and car chases and gadgets and 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 uh, martial arts and all that sort of thing. Reality, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Not, it's this is this is what women's spy business is. It's schmoozing. It's running a bar. Okay, the story in in Algiers. What is Svetlana doing? Svetlana has been told, you're the gangster's niece. You're the grand hostess of this, of this tap room called the Leningrad Tap Room. It's where all the Soviet sailors from the two Soviet ships that are parked in the anchorage come to for Russian cooking and drinks and all that type of thing. And your job is to go over there, be cute, and listen to drunk sailors tell their stories and listen to their slips up, slip ups and catch all the gossip. You're the femme fatale. Yeah. You've seen those pictures. We all look much better 30 years ago, didn't we? You know? <laughs> We're not even touching that. Okay. So. You know where I'm going with it, but you sell those pictures, okay? And that yeah. was the femme fatale. Oh, drop the, dead, that, gorgeous. Yeah. That was the femme fatale who just listened to these poor poor sailors away from mother Russia and, uh, you know, here have another vodka, you know, and, and that was the deal. And just listen, yeah. just listen. And, and the last page, one of the last pages in the book, there's a quote from Mata Hari and there's a quote from me underneath it. And they're damn near the same quote. Okay. The best role I ever had in my life was playing my authentic self. Yes. How's that? Did you just drop an F bomb on me? <laughs> Did I? Maybe, maybe not. Did I? So, Did I it's slip? Okay. okay. It did. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. 
But I am a sailor. I I mean, I I know you're a sailor, (laughs) but I am just. I'm just razzing you about that. I hope as I far do. as I know, that's not a, so that's not a negative. I'm trying to be much more cultured about it. So. Well, you did say it very smoothly, mm-hmm. so it's all good. Well, right if there. If it said it with etiquette and style, you know. It was. You were very stylish. There's a program but, There's a program on Netflix called The Diplomat. Yeah. Okay. And Linda didn't see it last season. So now the second season came out. I sat down over lunch hour, lunchtime, and we watched The Diplomat together. And she is sitting here listening to this thing. And says, "Oh my God, they talk like you." <laughs> <laughs> Heavens forbid, right? Yeah. For your friends listening, this is the name of the book. Now, if you go on Amazon, you go up there and look for second oldest profession. It'll be about six yes. books. A couple of them are about spycraft. The other ones, uh, one of them is about being a, being a mom or something like that. You know, <laughs> but this is this is the second oldest profession. And it's got Soviets. This was done by a nice lady who did it for only a hundred dollars. She did the cover for me, and really? she designed. It's a beautiful her, cover, her and that's not showing how red it is. That is a brilliantly red book. Oh God, you can flag an aircraft with this thing. Yeah, you can. And, and her, uh, she designs movie posters. You've seen her movie posters in the theater. She designs movie posters for a living. Okay. Wow. And and she saw a rough that I did with like the, uh, these symbols on it, and it was not right. well done. And she said, an hour later, she sent me back this cover. Nice. And, and I went back with notes and said, okay, I need certain letters a little bit more intense, da 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 And I said, I'm thinking she's going to charge a grand for it or something like that. She gave it to me for 150 bucks. Oh, wow. And she got a free book, obviously, and she's credited. No it. doubt. Her name's Re- it's, Renee. It's beautiful. Again, it, it's fun. And uh, she wants a crack at the second one, the, 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 the sequel, or not sequel, the prequel. Pre- so we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what I happens, have, but I'm having fun writing the prequel. Um, I had a big complaint today as I was writing it. Okay, uh, Svetlana was the character, Svetlana Kachinka. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, former former Soviet Air Force officer. Okay, lieutenant. Okay, actually, Shiesky lieutenant, senior lieutenant, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, she is. Um, uh, she was going to the other facility for Russians in, in Algiers, and the yeah. uh, currency there now is different. I, I'm not sure what. I think it's, it's something like euros or something. But what it was then was dinara. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, so uh, she's the, the taxi driver is trying to charge her like double what the for a two mile ride to this tea house russian tea room and she says do you know mutsafa over at the russian and have run in when it had three room uh, 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 cap room and he says oh yeah we're good friends we've done business for years gives me lots of customers and she simply looks at him and says i'm the gangster's niece <laughs> oh suddenly the fair is like in half yeah <laughs> It's all about who you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything it, is. Everything's about who you know, and so I've spilled a lot. If I'm not in cuffs tomorrow, I'll feel okay. <laughs> I haven't well, given you anything wouldn't. that they could they could they could hold against me. Yeah, I know. Well, you the, know, I know when I was reading, is. yeah, when I was reading, I'm just like, oh, it's been so nice knowing her. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> Somebody's going to come and yank her chain. So, you know, you know, in the UFO business, people say to me, So, oh, aren't you afraid of the men in black? I says, No, they're nice. They bring coffee and donuts when they want to lean on you. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I do know. I've been leaning on, and I know you've been leaning on, you know. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it, it, it well, rots. And people don't believe you when you say you get leaned on by these people, but they do. And, uh, after I gave a 17-page technical report to that um, the congressman down who had the guy, the, the deep the deep mouth, deep throat guys, 
uh, yeah. on that congressional hearing, and suddenly everything went black. Yeah. Um, uh, I had sent him, a, a, his staff, a 17-page report at the request of somebody from his staff. Suddenly, it was like it never happened. Yeah. So the fix is in, as they say. Well, the fix is in, and that it's going to be the you know the narrative is going to be what they want to share, and it's so frustrating. And I tell David that I'm getting back on the circuit this year. I am not going to be missing conferences. And of course, you know, I was recovering from a fall, then another fall. So, yeah. Well, you know, I haven't been to any conferences for 18 months now. Yeah, I know. And goofy, huh? Okay. Yeah. And, and two things were fed back to me. One, some people were warned off on having me come and talk about statistics. And two, there was this other aspect of that. There were a couple of shows, uh, a couple of the uh, bigger shows um, did not, because of all the negativeness towards trans individuals, um, they didn't want to put me at risk by coming to their, having me come to their state. That's ludicrous. Yeah, well, the Arkansas event, remember the last time we spoke there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I was there. I, yeah, I know you were. Okay. And at the beginning of our presentation, I showed a slide of all the people I had been, you know, uh, uh, what yeah. I looked like from being in the Navy right up through who I am now. And I said, this guy in the Navy did all this analysis work, and this is where the skills are coming from to write these books and show you these numbers we're going to put up here in slides. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the YouTube version of that, they have since edited out that portion. Really? Yeah, I've had I had several letters from people told me to go out there and look at it. And it used to be there, but they edited out me explaining who I really was, where I had come from, and what I used to be, who I used to be, and that it's where my skills come from to do all this kind of stuff. Right. They took it out. So uh, I that's when that's I sort of so believe weird. That's when I started believing all the issues that there were shows that did not want me to come because they were afraid for my safety. Some said that they they were afraid of my safety. That's what I've heard back from a few people. So I don't expect well, I'll get invited to anything more except some podcasts. That's about it. Well, I actually touch more people on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one got, you know, the timing screwed up, but the replays are going to be hot. But the... The main thing is that what you do is so much bigger than there's not anybody else really doing what you do. So yeah. they're shortchanging their, their guests, their participants by doing that. Because if anybody knows you, they would know that you're perfectly capable of taking care of you. And I hate that you're being shortchanged in that way. It, Linda and I only set out to do the first 20 years of the 21st century. And that's what yeah. we did. Okay. A major university took my papers. In fact, I was just talking yeah. to them the other day. They want me to, uh, they want me to send them all 53 books that we've done on UFOs. They want to make sure all my books are in their collection. Is that and Dave right, Marler? No, no, no. That's State University of New York at Albany took my papers. Okay. He's I'm one of the six people who coined the term transgender back in the day. Yeah. Okay. So they looked at me like uh, uh, they've got a special society up there called the New York State Political Influencers. And, and they've added me to that database because I changed things back in the day. Right. Okay. Now, let's go the other way. Um so I've managed to come up with a way. I've canvassed some people who were very generous, and they're gonna, they're giving me the funds to trickle every one of the books that I have out there right now that are related to UFOs. One full set to Dave Marler for his archives, and he's asked for that. And we found a way to. I can't ship them all at once. It would cost a fortune to ship them, but if we trickle yeah. two or three at a time to them, that would be fine. We can do that. 
Um, same thing with the University of New York, State University of New York at Albany. Um, we're going to make sure they have the entire collection as well. They're going to get our database. We've dumped it down to a special hard drive and virtually taken it off my, all the data off my personal computer because it was just taking up too much space. And uh, we're going to pass that along. Um, there might be two more UFO books coming out of this household. Mm -hmm. Linda's writing one. I can't talk about it. Um, I'm looking at one, a, a very high level um, look back over the years and where I see things going at this particular date and time. Um, right. And, and literally date the book and say, this, this is where my perspective is coming from. And it's looking back over the years. So if that's if I publish it, but I've been tinkering right. on it. I've been writing and when I get bored, I'll kick on the microphone and narrate some stuff into, into the yeah. text. You know? and it's I have found dead. that that's my favorite way to write. <laughs> so, well, you know, I've, got a, thing, I've got a thing called pro, edit it. I got a thing called pro writer software called pro writer. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks at it and tells me where I got to fix things. Okay. Oh, and it, nice. it doesn't, it, it's like 97%. It's pretty, it's pretty damn good. And uh, it was, I got a 40 year license so to speak, and it's really brilliant stuff. And that's what I use to clean up myself. And that's why I'm getting, I, I've written four novels. The first one I've ever published is the spy book. Right. Okay. But I've gone back and I've cleaned up two of the other novels. I'm going to release them this year. And I've got a collection of all my mysteries that I'm going to release a compilation of all my mysteries. Cool. Uh, that's going to come out uh, by spring, probably, you know, takes a oh, lot of people to think, awesome. well, you just put it in the word document and send it to Amazon. No, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> There's no. a, lot of, a lot of work that goes into it. So, yeah. Well, we are, we are out running low, We're yes. running low, but you know, I am, I, I so much appreciate you coming on with me because A, I love talking to you. B, I like turning on my listeners to what you do. And, you know, the, the UFO books are where we started. And the UFO experiences also. And, you know, I always tell people that story about fate about the Johnny Appleseed story and you not knowing it was published, but I'm so glad that we came together with this friendship so that you were on with me. And I went and said something to Phyllis about how you, you know, you thought that was such a great idea. And this and she was like, well, I did publish that. <laughs> so and she knew exactly what edition it was. And she went and got two copies of that to send to you. Because do you know, do you know I did, do you know what I did uh, this past spring. Um, I the Cuyahoga Library System here, Cuyahoga, uh, Cuyahoga County mm -hmm. is the library system for the Cleveland metropolitan area. They have like mm -hmm. forty branches, and I gave um, talks about that paper at at libraries. I was paid to come there. It was and give a great a talk, paper. Give a talk. Yeah. I mean, it was a great. It was great. And so, we'll talk about that the next time you come on too, because we're going to run that. out of time and I don't want okay. to, okay. but um, tell people the, how to find you. Or do okay. That whole spiel. Okay. The real quick one, go on Amazon book search, look for Cheryl Good Costa, book, guys. Cheryl yeah. Costa and new second oldest profession. Now, if you just go second oldest profession, you get hit with about eight books, but if you go Cheryl Costa, second oldest, you'll get this. Yes. And it can have yeah. it to you in two or three days, unless you're in boonie land. And then maybe maybe about eight days, but <laughs> yeah. you'll get it. I guarantee it's a good read. Uh, it is a great read. You're falling, you're falling asleep in bed reading it. You're having a ball. So enjoy. Yes. I wore that book. So <laughs> as a pair of glasses, apparently. But yes. thank you so much for joining me. Always. Anytime you need Namaste. Me. Namaste. And for all of our listeners, thank you so much. Y'all are the reason that we do this. And I sure do appreciate every single one of you. So we will see you next week here on Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. Same cat time, same cat channel. That's Good night. Good <laughs>